on Indians. <laughs> and I like to put feathers in my hair and paint my face up, so. <clears throat> and you used to wear beads. Yeah, stuff. I used to wear beads and stuff like that. Moxins. Moxins. <laughs> but, uh, we also had, uh, over the years, especially during, uh, I remember during uh, our Cheech and Chong days. <laughs> <laughs> and those would be the days when Michael, well, we were traveling back and forth across the country from the center of the country, east coast and whatever, out to California and back and forth. And we were, oh, about us. Well, we were homeless, but back then they called them hippies. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and I fortunately, one time when, when I went through my hometown of Cleveland there, I picked up the camping gear that I'd had when I was a kid. You know, I literally an old canvas tent, uh, one of those, remember the old uh, Coleman stoves, you had to blow up, you know, put the gas in, whatever, and I'd camp on the Hopi Indian Reservation when I'd, when I'd have extra time, when I, I didn't want to get, get back to L.A., I, I wanted to hang for a little while, so I'd hang on the Hopi Indian Reservation, and, and of course I'd immediately set up camp and then hang wind chimes and wind mm -hmm. socks and all that kind of stuff in the, in the, the pinion pine around the camp, and the, the Hopis were very nice, they kind of just shake their heads. <laughs> Another hippie camped out here, but they were very nice to us. And in fact, uh, 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 we actually got an opportunity to uh, uh, to see some of the dances for a little while there. We uh, certainly did. Tom uh, left L.A., escaped, I should say, L.A. before I did. It took, uh, it took us three months to save up enough money to move to L.A. and three years to save up enough to get the hell out of there. <laughs> but he, uh, and his wife and little girls at the time were, as he said, living in a tent. His rent ran out before mine. They camped out in my backyard for a while, and then they, and they took off for the Hopi Reservation. And I was just getting ready to leave. The last thing I had to do was go get tires on my 1957 sunroof, crank canvas top sunroof Volkswagen. And I was on the Pasadena Freeway, came around a curve, and all the traffic was stopped, and I managed to stop. But a guy in a little sports car going way too fast didn't stop and just creamed me from behind. So two more weeks went by. I'd already gotten rid of all my furniture and everything. I had a mattress on the floor was all there was. So two weeks with, with no car, way up on a hill, having to walk up and down to get groceries and things. And, uh, and Tom was out there camped in the desert waiting for me. <coughs> and uh, we finally made it. I finally escaped and drove for like 30-something hours uh, straight through. And I had, there was a big hole in the bottom of the floorboard of my Volkswagen, all this carbon monoxide was coming out in my face the whole time. And by the time I got there, it was in pretty bad shape. My eyes were just burned. Uh, so watching the Indians do dance on top of this mesa was pretty, uh, pretty psychedelic. Actually, it was, it was the Hopi snake dance, which was uh, seriously, which was really a, it was, it was an incredibly cool thing. Poor Michael, it looked like somebody had taken his eyes and painted them with fingernail polish and then taken their fingers and done that. You know, it just looked horrible. So at any rate, uh, been very influenced by uh, Native America. A couple of years ago, I had the opportunity to go down uh, like the second time. I spent uh, some time in the Andes of Bolivia. And this uh, last, last time was uh, in a little community about 10, 11,000 feet up in the Andes called Takachia, the Aymara Indians. And we had some college students down there, civil engineers, trying to uh, find a way to help get clean water. And, uh, so uh, I'd like to dedicate this song to the Hopi and uh, to Michael and I and to the people of Takachia, Bolivia. And uh, it's the happiest song we know. Oh, I'd like to say too that we uh, we learned this song off the radio. This is back when FM radio was brand new. It was back when we were traveling all over the heartland playing schools. And uh, there was a it, remember when FM was brand new, it was called Underground. Yeah. Really cool, no commercials, you know. The last thing you would hear would be somebody's hit single with this album cut. Sometimes they would play whole albums and things like that. And you'd hear stuff you normally would never hear. There was a station out of Little Rock, Arkansas, and the show was called Beaker Street, and Clyde Clifford was the DJ. This thing had a huge output. We run into people from the Dakotas to Florida who used to listen to that show. We were certainly among them out there in the middle of the heartland and listening to that. Because Tom and I were literally living the Easy Rider story back in those days. Said it wasn't that easy. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> Picking and choosing, you know, where we stopped to get something to eat or, or anything. Because not many people in, in Nebraska or Kansas looked anything like us in 1968, you know. We kind of like glowed in the dark with our neighbor shirts and beads and things. So we, every now and then we'd hear this song on the radio, and we would just wait for it while we're driving all night or something. It was by a band called Everything is Everything. It was, 
and it was headed up uh, by a Native American gentleman named Jim Pepper, who's actually a jazz saxophonist from Portland, Oregon. And we were just there a few weeks, or last week, and got to see Jim Pepper's house. He's deceased now, but actually got to see uh, the house where Jim Pepper lived. I got to burn one right in front of his house. Burn one right in front of his house. And like Tom said, this is the happiest song we know. A couple of thousand years old. Run, 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 run